the uh, 8 o'clock service, and I'm looking, I'm looking forward to seeing who it's going to be in the 915 service. But uh, I, I predicted, uh, as we started the 8 o'clock service, that somewhere around 10 till 9, we would have the door open several times, all right, of uh, people thinking they were coming to the 8 o'clock service. And we had a lady just come, one of our regulars, come right on in, go get her coffee. And she was filling up her coffee before she realized I was almost through with the serpent. So we had some fun with her, all right? So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing who we're going to have some fun with at about 10.15, uh, all right? So just, if it happens, I'll give you all the nod, just everybody turn. <laughs> What is the image or the first thing that pops in your mind when I say the word judge? Judy. 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 What was that? Court. Okay. See, there's probably a few of you in here, maybe more than just a few, who have some very vivid memories regarding the judge. This will probably date me just a little bit. But as I thought about Judge this last week, the first image that came to my mind was Flip Wilson. Back in the late 60s and the early 70s, all right, he would strut out on stage singing that song. Order in the court, order in the court, here come the judge, here come the judge. Now, that really got driven home to me this weekend. Shelly and I have been to a couple of Fresno State baseball games, all right? And... Uh, there's a group of kids, college students, who sit right in front of the tunnel wall, all right, on the, uh, on the college side, and they do cheers and chants throughout the entire game. They have something for every one of the baseball players. They have a few for the umpires. They have a few for the opposing team's third base coach who comes over to their side every time. They are a rowdy but rather humorous group. Well, one of the ball players for Fresno State this year uh, the center fielder, he is a freak. <laughs> he is six foot seven center fielder. All right, highly unusual in baseball. Six seven. The guy is broad in the shoulders and narrow in the hips. He could be a great Samson. Okay. Uh, and anyway, his name is Aaron Judge. And so every time he comes up to bat, the chance starts. Order in the court. Order in the court. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. And last night, one of the retired principals of Clovis who sits in that area that we were sitting near, he asked those kids, hey, do you guys know where that originated? And they didn't know. I'm there 19, 20 years old. They had no idea. He said, laugh him. I hated to correct him. Yeah. Okay? I mean, but I said, you know, I think it was Flip Wilson. Actually, I was also wrong. Flip Wilson is probably the one who made it popular, but there's about three singing groups who have all recorded it as well, all right? And one of them was before Flip Wilson, but Flip is the one who really made it popular, and he might have done it on laughing, all right? Uh, but anyway, we, it came from the late 60s and the early 70s. Here comes the judge. As many of you have already stated, uh, you think about Judge Judy or Judge Mathis or the other reality TV judges. I'm not sure I've ever watched an entire full episode of one of those judge reality programs. But I've often wondered to myself, what possesses those people to go on? There? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and people told me in the last service, money. But I mean, is they, do they pay that well? I mean, because you know when you go on, the judge is going to rip you. He is going to make a fool out of you. And the few I've watched, every time, he always does that. I'm not sure there's enough money to do that publicly. Oh. Except for the person coming in late in the next no. service. <laughs> <laughs> but more often than not, I think of a judge as somebody who tells me that I've done something wrong, and then he hands down our punishment. A judge never seems to call us into court to tell us that we've done something good. I mean, wouldn't that be great if we did? I mean, order in the court! Order in the court! Tim Rowland, you're the defendant. Would you please stand? Tim, we find you guilty of being a good citizen and a great pastor. Now, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, that never happened. Never. As a result, most of us are afraid.
afraid of judges. But in our journey through the story, this one seamless story of the Bible, we've come to a period of 300 years in Old Testament history called by the students of the Bible the period of the judges. It's a significant section in the Old Testament. In fact, the book that chapter 8 is taken from bears that very name, Judges. But the description of a judge in the Old Testament is very different than our modern day prototype that is conjured up in our minds when we hear that word. In the same way as today, the judge of the Old Testament was to call truth, truth, and a lie, a lie. But unlike the judges of today, the Old Testament judges are more responsible about getting people out of jail rather than putting people into jail. Now, wouldn't you like that kind of judge a whole lot better yeah. who was more interested in deliverance than he was condemnation? And as we look at chapter 8 today, and if you have your story with you, chapter 8 begins at page 103. If you are visiting with us today and you say, what's this story you're talking about? All of you with your hard backs, hold them up. All right, hold up the story so folks there you can see it. All right, that's what we're talking about. This is the same thing, Justin Lowder. The story is an abridged version of the Bible. It is set up in chronological order from the events in Genesis of creation to the book of Revelation, prophesying the future return of Jesus Christ. It's put in historical, contextual order. It eliminates all the duplicates and uh, some of what they consider not unimportant, but less necessary things that don't keep the thread of redemption in mind as they were recorded. Doesn't mean they don't have value. This is never to replace your Bible. But we live in such a culture today that many don't know how to find their way around the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's very confusing to folks. And so two pastors had this wonderful idea of putting it together in a format like we read a history book or a novel. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. No verses and no separate books inside of one big book. And so we are spending 31 weeks, we are in week 8, going through the story. You can pick these up at Majesty Christian Bookstore. I think they're still on sale for $14.95. You can download an audio version off of Kindle. Kindle. No, that's the written, the, the audio. audio. What's that? Audio. audio, thank you. Audio or audible.com. And I understand that's a wonderful way to uh, listen to it if you don't want to read it that way. And so that's absolutely terrific. You can also go back to our website at the church and listen to the previous sermons. And on Wednesday nights, following the Sunday sermon, we do a Q&A on the previous week's chapter. And so we hope by the time we finish this 31 weeks, we have a very good perspective and knowledge of the scriptures and the word and its application for our lives. <clears throat> As we look at chapter 8 of the story, let's do just a brief rewind. It's helpful to repeat so we get the flow of the story and get some of the ideas how the story fits in the overall plan of God's unfolding story of redemption and restoration. The nation of Israel at this very moment in the book of Judges or chapter 8 of the story, they are now occupying the land that God promised Abraham over 700 years before. And some of you thought that God was a little slow answering your prayer last week. 700 years went after God made the promise to Abraham. But they have now conquered the land under the leadership of Joshua and the undeniable power of God at work on their behalf. Now they are occupying the land of Canaan. But this is 700 years later. Of all the tribes of Israel, 10 of them have received their land. And then the Levites from Jacob's son Levi are the priestly tribe. They are in every one of the areas to minister the duties of the temple or the tabernacle as laid out in the Old Testament. God has set the people of Israel up in an awesome way. They have their own lands and their own homes. They're no longer foreigners or strangers in this world. They, are, uh, they have the tabernacle in their midst, which represents the presence of God. They have been re the recipients of God's law, particularly the Ten Commandments. That instructs them how they can relate to God and how they can get along with each other. If they will just follow the plan that God has for them, God says, I'm going to bless your socks off. 
That's an Alabama version of the scriptures, okay? I don't think God actually said your socks off, but God said, I will give you blessing upon blessing upon blessing, more than what they could ever understand or fully appreciate. But do they follow the plan? No, they don't. You see, there's a fundamental problem that we discovered in chapter 1. What is the fundamental problem of us experiencing God's best? Sin. sin. That horrible three-letter word, and what's right in the middle of sin? That's a wonderful confession you just made. It's called sin, and I is right in the middle of it. Sin still reigns in the hearts of people and judges, and it still reigns today in the 21st century. It seems like it just won't go away. It raises its ugly head, and it wrecks our relationships with others, and it gets us into big trouble on a lot of fronts. Under the leadership of Joshua, things go pretty well for the Israelites. There was blessings, and there were victories, and there was prosperity, and there was rest from war, as we discovered last week. However, two major mistakes took place after the death of Joshua. And it's described to us in the book of Judges and in chapter 8 of the story. And that opens the door for the Israelites to experience disaster, trouble, and ruin. We're told that the Israelites were instructed by God to completely drive out. There's a word that's used in the Bible. We don't like to use it much today, but I'm going to use it here and then I'll define it. They were told to utterly drive out the pagans. Okay? Who were the pagans? Everybody who wasn't Israelites, but why were they given that term pagans? Yeah, you all are hitting all around them. I can't, I can't fully hear whatever I said. It's because they worship other gods besides the living God. They worship gods that they made out of their own hands and they came up with out of their own minds. And so they were called pagans. And God told Israel, drive them out. And the reason God told them, drive them out, is because God knew that the Israelites still had this sin problem in their life, and that they would be drawn, instead of them influencing the pagans, the pagans would influence them, and they would start worshiping Baal and Asheroth and the other gods of the other nations around them. This action because they didn't utterly drive them out, would come back and to bite them as they left this presence of pagan worship in their community. We see then that environment that we place ourselves in really matters mm -hmm. as it relates to the health of our walk with God and even our relationship with others. So that's the Israelites' first mistake, is not taking care of their environment. I just thought of this this morning. I was reviewing the sermon for today. I remember my cousin Brenda. She was Aunt Ladine and Uncle Connell's <laughs> youngest daughter. All right? I remember Brenda during a, a period in her teen years when she was choosing to be a slightly rebellious. Okay? And Aunt Ladine was kind of frustrated with her. And so one day she sat down with Brenda and said, Brenda, what is the matter with you? Brenda being a little edgy at that point and trying to kind of, you know, just jabbing her mom. She said, Mom, I am a product of my heredity or my environment, and you are the source of both. <laughs> <laughs> that did not fly real well. All right? <clears throat> but it stuck with us for a long time. But see, Brenda was absolutely correct. We are a product of our heredity. What did all of us inherit? Sin, sin nature. Sin nature. And we are often influenced by our environment. The second mistake that we're introduced to right at the beginning of the book of Judges, or chapter 8, helps us understand the rest of this part of the story. It says that Joshua died, and the generation that followed him did not know God, nor what God had done for them. That's on page 103, if you want to turn to that in your story, 103, or uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, if you didn't have it. All right, it's the third paragraph down, and it says, After the whole generation had gathered to their ancestors, that means they all died. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor 
what he had done for Israel. Maybe you have heard the phrase before that says Christianity is just one generation away from extinction. Luis Palau did a film many years ago that says it like this. God has no grandchildren. Every generation must choose for themselves to have a relationship with God. Joshua, when he was leading Israel, influenced the nation to have a relationship with God. After Joshua died, apparently there was no one to lead that charge, and the scripture says they forgot who God was. For us to be too busy in our work, in our hobbies, in our family life, even in church work, to not bring a child, our children along for the experience, not to sit them down and faithfully read and share the Bible with them, to work through the stories, to help them understand who God is can be a costly mistake. Because as you and I get older, as you get older, <laughs> as, as we move out of leadership, but we are still alive, Who steps in these places of leadership will determine whether God governs and leads us or not. All of us, even those of us maturing, will dramatic, that's a fine way of saying older. We will be impacted by the health or the lack of health of a relationship with God that they have. And it really falls on us to prepare the next generation. It is in this context that God raises up a team of judges to deal with the sin of the people, to assist in getting them out of jail and on their road to deliverance and restoration. It's very important to understand in this story that the surrounding nations are watching how God is dealing justly and graciously with the nation of Israel now that they're in their land. You see, God disciplines his children according to his law, which is just, but also merciful. He powerfully intervenes when they cry out for help, and he keeps taking them back. Do you get the drift? God says, I want to spend time with you, and then his people go spend time with another God, and then they end up in trouble, and they cry out to God, and God rescues them, and he brings them back. Why? Because he wants to spend time with them. Now get this idea in your mind. The other nations, who some of them are taking Israel into captivity, some of them the ones oppressing Israel, they are watching how the God of Israel treats Israel. And they're going to compare how the God of Israel treats Israel compared to how the gods they have made with their own hands treat them. Wouldn't you think that they would look at this God of Israel and say, wow, look how they treat their God, and yet when they're in trouble, look how their God comes running, and he rescues, and he delivers them. Wow, I would like a God like that. See, they're watching. Your friends, your family, your co-workers are watching to see the kind of God that you have. If you want to understand the book of Judges and this 300-year period, it's very important for us to understand the big idea. I would say to you right now that the big idea of the book of Judges in chapter 8 is that there is a cycle, a pattern, that is repeated again and again and again. Now, I don't want us to get the big idea that you and I need to repeat this cycle again and again and again. I would like for us to discover this cycle and then break the cycle. But Judges gives us real clarity at least six times, if not more, all right, of the cycle repeating itself and how God responds to us. So let's, let's get the insight into that cycle that might give us great insight into how we can relate to God and break the cycle. So the first movement in the cycle is that the Israelites sin. They blow it. We see this again and again and again. The phrase... How many of you read this phrase as you read the chapter several times? It says, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Did you notice that when you read it? Just in case you didn't, let me take you through it. All right? Page 103 in the story. Third paragraph. Third sentence. 
Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Flip over a page, page 104. Top of the page, all right, first paragraph, second sentence. Yet they would not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. All right, bottom of that same page, first sentence, last paragraph. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord God, and they served the Baals and the Asherahs. Next page, 105, right in the middle of the page. Second paragraph, first sentence. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Flip over to page 107. Second paragraph, or third paragraph, if you, don't, if you count the italic part. First line, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Page 112. Okay. First sentence, top of the page. No sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves them, themselves <laughs> themselves let's see if I can talk like a Californian for a moment I'm just thinking about going to Oklahoma and I'm talking that way. third paragraph again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord that is seven times in this one chapter we have this same verdict now what was the primary evil or sin, and I've given you a clue with a few of those things that I read, what was the primary sin that they committed? Worshiping other gods. That was a violation of the very first commandment. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. And when we do, when we disobey, particularly on this first command, there's going to be all kinds of unfortunate outcomes, evil that emerges out of it. And even today in our Christian walk, when we do not allow God to be preeminent in our life, when we do not let Jesus Christ be preeminent, let's talk about that word for just a minute. When you hear the word preeminent, we don't use that every day in our vocabulary, all right? What does it mean to be preeminent? This is why we're going to talk about it. The answer is no, it doesn't mean before anything else. What I want us to understand, often in church, often from pastors, often from teach, teachers and leaders, we say, let's put God first in our life, and then maybe it's family second, and then church third. No. Try to visualize your relationship with God more as a spoke of a wheel. And we want Jesus Christ at the very center, the hub. So that everything that revolves in our life revolves around this relationship we have with God. The word I think best describes, at least helps clarify for me, what it means for Jesus to be preeminent is that his life permeates every area of my life. See, often when we talk about priority, we talk about time spent. How much time do I spend? How much time do I spend? Well, quite frankly, folks, your relationship with God, I want it to be 24-7. Every moment of every day, living and walking in dependence upon Him. But, but I want Him to permeate whatever it is that I'm doing. So if you're sitting in worship, I want your relationship with God to permeate your participation in worship. When you are at home, relating to your spouse or your kids, I want your relationship with God to permeate your conversation and your thought process about your, your spouse and your children. When you are at work, I want your relationship with God to permeate your activity on the job. Like my friend who worked with me at the Bible house and his job was cleaning the toilets. And I would walk by the hallway in the morning before anybody got there, and I would hear Jim singing to the top of his lungs. And I would open the bathroom door, and he's on his knees in front of the urinal, all right? And he is scrubbing it, singing praises. And I'm saying, Jim, what are you doing? He said, I'm cleaning this as if Jesus is going to use it today. <laughs> wow. I kind of like that, all right? I mean, here's a, here's a Bible college student. He was more qualified than being a janitor, but that was the only job open, and he wanted it. And he dealt with it as it, it permeated his attitude in the way in which he behaved. I want it to permeate our life when we are doing our hobbies, even golf. <laughs> when you're not having a good day. I went Friday. Did he help you? 
I hit 14 of my 15 warm-up shots on the driving range exactly where I wanted to hit them. Never happened in my life. I told Bill Eccles, we better get out there right now. It's not going to last very long. And it didn't. Third hole. Tim is my witness. It, it, went, it went south in a hurry. But, but how do we let this relationship with Christ permeate every area of our life? In a movie called The End of the Spear, Jim Elliott and some other missionaries who were ministering to the Aka Indians, they were headhunters in South America. They were all martyred. Before he was killed, he wrote some beautiful, beautiful things. And one of the, the most famous lines that Jim Elliott wrote that has been remembered by thousands is this one line. Love God and do whatever you want. Love God and do whatever you want. The scripture says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. If you love God with all that you are, do whatever you want. Because it's going to fit in with your love for God. The primary evil of the Israelite sin was that they worshipped other gods. They took God out of center stage of their lives. And that sin led to the second movement in the cycle. And that second movement in the cycle is oppression. The Israelite sinful lifestyle led them to a place outside of God's provision. It took them outside of the boundaries that God had laid out for them. And it allowed the other nations to come in and oppress, take advantage of them, and bully them. God was promising to bless them if they stayed in His plan. But now, after their repeated sin, God is not responsible for the outcome of their poor decisions. They said, I want to worship the Baal of the Moabites. God says, okay, then let the Moabite God take care of you. Mm -hmm. See, when you and I choose another God over him, then we come under the providence of the other God that we have put in his place. And so God would say, okay, let the Moabites take care of you. Yeah. Judges chapter 2, verse 22 we get some insight into what's going on behind all of these scenes. And God is speaking. It's page 104 of the story. And he said, I will use them. That's the surrounding nations. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. God is using natural consequences of their evil behavior to reveal to Israel what life is like without his supernatural presence. Let me say that one again, because this is a pretty good line. God is using the natural consequence of their evil behavior to reveal to Israel what life is like without His supernatural presence. You don't want God to be preeminent? You want to put another God in His place? Then God will say, okay, experience the best that you can do as God or whatever it is that you will put your trust in besides me, experience the natural consequences of those decisions if you want to live outside of my supernatural presence. He's using the oppression from these pagan nations as a consequence of their sin and a form of discipline. Six times we're going to see this cycle occur in the book of Judges. And each time, the Israelites are going to be oppressed by a different pagan nation. Let me list the different nations and how many years the Israelites spent oppressed in the book of Judges. Uh, there's the Mesopotamians who took control of the Israelites, and they did it for eight years. Then there's the Moabites. They did it for 18 years. Then there's the Canaanites. That's 20 years. Then there's the Midianites. That's seven years. Then there's the Ammonites. That's 18 years. And then there's the Philistines. That's 40 years. How many years is that? It's 111. Okay, I already added up. I had a calculator. <laughs> when we realize that the period of Judges covered in chapter 8 is approximately 330 years, then 111 of those 330 years that they lived as an oppressed nation, as a people, for one third of the season of their existence, they were an oppression. And when I read that, I think to myself, what a shame. What a waste of time with life. And then you and I need to look closely in a mirror and say, God, how much time have I passed that I wasted 
in pursuing other guys. Don't stay guilty there, but move on from there and don't go back there. So there is the first cycle, that's sin. The second cycle, that's oppression. And then oppression leads to the third movement of the cycle, and that is repentance. We read about these six experiences, and eventually, every single time, the Israelites cry out to the Lord. The phrase is used again and again. The Israelites finally reach bottom, and they turn back to God. Some things never change. What do they tell folks that celebrate recovery? Your recovery won't happen until you reach bottom. And then they tell you everybody's bottom is different. And if you walk behind everybody, you'll discover that. <laughs> and then comes the judge. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I really did. You were at bottom. This is, this is where the judge comes in. Up until this point, there's been no presence of the judge in these communities. But it's at this point, the point where repentance is needed, that a judge emerges. And the judges are going to lead the people through the process of repentance. Because the path to restoration, rescue, and deliverance, which is the fourth movement in the cycle, it must always come through repentance. You can't get to the fourth part of the cycle by avoiding the third part of the cycle. C.S. Lewis, that brilliant, brilliant man, once an atheist, who became a believer, he said, a Christian is not one who never goes wrong, but a Christian is one who is unable to repent and start again after each stumble because of the inner working of Jesus Christ in their life. Just like the Israelites, we today, because of the way of our lives, get ourselves into deep trouble. We cry out to God. We want God to restore our lives, but we often don't want to go through the, the path or the pain of repentance. But the way of God is that you and I confess and repent, and that leads to that wonderful final stage of deliverance and rescue. There's a long list of judges in the book of Judges, but there's a list of the primary judges, which is six, that led the children of Israel out of those six different oppressions. Remember I, miss, I, I mentioned the Mesopotamians. All right? It was Othniel who was the judge selected by God to rescue them through repentance. Then there was the Moabites, and there was Ehud, who God chose as the judge to bring them out of there. We don't have time to get our arms around that story. One of you got that one? I have one in the 8 o'clock service. Remember what Ehud did? Just a footnote. Remember, he is the one who stabbed the real bad guy. The guy was so fat that the fat, you know, consumed his hand and lost it. All right, can't get our arms around that one. Okay. <laughs> Work with me today. Then there was the Canaanites, and that was Deborah. Deborah, we'll talk about her briefly in a minute. Then there was the Midianites, and God used Gideon there. And then there was the Ammonites, and God used the judge Jephthah. Wow, that's a story. We're not even touching that one today. And then there's the Philistines, and all of us know, most of us, anyway, know the story or heard of the character Samson. And then there was one more, and that's the termites, and we have Orkin, the judge. <laughs> <laughs> Just to check and see if you're awake, all right? Just go with me today, all right? Some of you know some of these stories. Samson is probably the most popular of all of them. That's the last one in the book, probably the most popular. The judges come in at the place of the cycle of repentance. They come in when the Israelites are at rock bottom in their oppression. They're crying out to God to rescue them from this low place. God hears them. He raises up a judge and leads them through this period of repentance. And it ultimately leads to that last phase of the cycle. And that is deliverance and rescue. So there's the four cycles. Sin, oppression, repentance, rescue, or deliverance. 300 years of chapter 8 wrapped up in four words. Sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance. God's hand of blessing returns to the Israelites in this stage of deliverance. He returns to us at this same point as well. <coughs> the stories of deliverance in the book of Judges are remarkable. I think it would be a slam dunk if Hollywood ever decided to do a back-to-back, -back, six-week sequel story of the six Judges. It would be phenomenal. It is clear from each of these stories that it is not the judge but it is God, God at work in the scene of the judge orchestrating the restoration and the deliverance from oppression. Probably the most famous story is the story of Samson. 
He's the one with the long hair. We think, of, we think often, many people think, that the secret to Samson's strength was in his hair. But guys, work with me for just a moment. If that were true, how many of us in the 60s and 70s would have been he-men? Okay? And now, some of you who had all that hair in the 60s or 70s, you are bald, all right? But you're not weakly, all right? You're not weakly, because the strength was not in our hair, all right? When Samson cut his hair off, he did it in defiance of his relationship with God. It's not the lack of hair, but it's the lack of faith and trust and obedience in the God who called him to serve. He's the most famous judge, but maybe the most unusual judge is Deborah. And why would she be the most unusual judge? You guys are so smart. They did not have a lot of women's liberation back then, all right? But Deborah was a judge. What does her name mean? Mother of Israel. No. That's a good shot. Honeybee. Her name means honeybee. Her vision of the world is not shaped by the political situation of her day, but it's developed by her relationship with God. Though women of the ancient world did not usually become political leaders, Deborah was what Israel needed at the time. She was a woman, a prophetess, who heard God and believed Him. She is a woman who had the courage needed. Her courage aroused the people, enabling them to throw off foreign oppression. The cycle is once again illustrated for us. Israel had been delivered from their enemies. There was peace in the land. And after a few years of peace, Israel forgets God. They turn back to idols. God uses the Canaanites from Hazar to discipline Israel. He oppressed Israel for 20 years. After they were oppressed, they cried out to God for help again. Deborah is a woman among men. She is brave. She is intelligent. She is trustworthy. She is confident of God's word and presence. She rules Israel under a palm tree that bears her name, the Deborah Palm. The Israelites will bring their disputes to her, but she is more than just an arbitrator. She is a prophetess. She speaks on God's behalf, one who acts between God and man, and she lets the people know God's will. If I were to comment here, I would say she was the Joan of Arc. She's an extraordinary woman. It's not about what Deborah does. It is why she does it. God asks her, and no matter what the cost, Deborah chose to act in faith. My favorite story is the story of Gideon. And that's found in Judges chapter 7, if you brought your Bibles, Judges 7, pages 108 to page 111 of the story. The Midianites are oppressing the Israelites, and God raises up Gideon to lead the children of Israel. They're crying out for repentance again. Save us! And God says to Gideon, Gideon, you and I are going to take our people back. The story goes like this. The Midianites are in a battle. There are ten tons of Midianites all around. We're told they have so many camels you can't count them. Gideon is a, a farmer boy. All right? The story goes like this. He is the least of his family, and his family is the least of the twelve tribes of Israel. If you talk about a guy who had a reason for low self-esteem, it was Gideon. Gideon on the bottom of the barrel, God. You're choosing me, just the man I need. Why? Because you trust me. You believe in me. That trust is going to get tested. It always does. Hmm. So Gideon puts the word out. We're gonna we're gonna be rescued. God's gonna deliver us. I need an army. Thirty-two thousand people respected this bottom of the barrel farmer. Thirty-two thousand men show up for this volunteer army. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, that's too many. I mean, get the idea of an army to have the bigger army? The more the merrier, the more the better. God said, you see, here's why. Because God did not want Gideon and the Israelites to think it was the size of their army that won the battle. And God did not want the other nations who were looking on to this event to think that it was the size of the army that won the battle. This is going to be a repeat of a Jericho story. That there is no, what's a miracle? How do we define a miracle around the world? No other explanation but God. And so there's going to be no other explanation for, but God for this particular battle. And so God says, okay, Gideon, here's the way we're going to reduce your army right off the bat. Gideon, ask any of your soldiers, if any of them are afraid, the least little bit, tell them to go home. 
22,000 were afraid and they went home. Most of us, when we read that, we said, cowards. <laughs> yes, it is. Would we have been one of those 22,000? Very possibly so. He has 10,000 left. Then he said, okay, 10,000. Pretty good size army. God says, good, he's still got too many. I want you to tell everybody to go down by the river and take a drink of water. And everyone who left water up like a dog, send them home. All those who kneel and cup water up, those of you soldiers. Over the years, people have asked, is there any significance? I know mean, there's something special. The Bible doesn't tell us. So I really can't tell you. I can give you an assumption. I can suggest to you that a person who cups the water up has his eyes up. He's aware. He's observant. The one who goes down with their head down in the water and laps it like a dog can't see the enemy that's going on around. They're not aware of anything else. Just an assumption. The Bible doesn't tell us. It just may have been God's whittling process. And I'm sure Gideon was praying, Lord, let 300 laugh like a dog and let 9,700 cut the no, Just 300 are left. And God says, that's my army. <laughs> okay, God, what's our, what's our weapons going to be? God says, no problem, Gideon. I'm going to give, I want you to give each of your soldiers a pitcher. And I want you to give each of your soldiers a candle. And I want you to tell them to have their outside voices ready. And we're going to give trumpets to a few guys. But God, what about the armor and the swords and the arrows and the bow? No, none of those are necessary. Pitcher, a candle, loud voices, and trumpets. And I will give you this victory, Gideon. This is not told in the story. You've got to go to Judges 7 for this part, but this is important. Gideon says, God, I, I believe you, but I'm scared. You ever been there? God, I believe you, but I'm scared. God says, okay, Gideon. Since you're scared, I want to help you out. Sneak in to the enemy camp tonight, and I'll take away your fear. <laughs> you got the 300, you're the leader, you are to sneak in in the middle of the night to this enemy camp of thousands, and I'll take away your fear. And so Gideon gets one of his best friends, and he says, I want company if I'm going to be slaughtered. <laughs> and would you go with me? And they sneak into camp, and they get by one of the army leaders' tents, and this guy wakes up from his sleep. And he wakes up his buddy in the tent. He says, let me tell you about this dream I just had. This big giant thing comes rolling into camp and it wipes us all out. I think that's Gideon and God. And Gideon jumps up and they run back to camp. And Gideon says, get up, boys, we're going to win. <laughs> Here's the sad part of that story. When God tells Gideon they're going to win, he drags his feet. When the enemy announces Gideon's going to win. He runs to battle. Why do you and I have to hear others that are afraid of our God? Why can't you and I just believe God and go forward? In the New Testament, well, here's the thing we need to know. The same cycle is at work in our lives as Christians today. We sin. Our primary problem is we do not keep the Lord preeminent in our life. We put other gods before Him, and that causes all kinds of evil to emerge. We, put, uh, we get steeped in addictions. Our character, our selfishness runs wild. There's things like anger, pride, deception. We chase after the wrong things to make us happy. Sex, money, possessions, power, pleasure. The list goes on. John says in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What I want to suggest is four categories of sin. And I want you to identify which one of the four best describes where you are right now. What is your greatest propensity or your greatest inclination to sin? Which one of these four categories does it come for you? Do not give your answer out loud. <laughs> Personal reflection. First one. I am chasing the wrong things. Second one, my priorities 
are all mixed up. Third one, I have an addiction or an addictive personality. Fourth, I keep mistreating others. So we sin. That leads us in the same way as with the Israelites to an experience of oppression. Our sin oppresses us in various ways. It breaks our fellowship with God. I know that when my kids were living at home and there was a little break in our relationship, they would hide. They would avoid. They would ignore. It's what we do when something damages the relationship. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. When we commit sin, we hide from God. John suggests the same kind of cycle in New Testament believers. When in 1 John 1, 6, he says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. What John is saying to us is simply to try not to deceive the people around you that our relationship with God is okay if it's not. If we're living in darkness, come clean. Repent. I want to list some depressions now. Excuse me. I want to list some oppressions right now. Maybe that was an intentional slip of the time. But I want you to lock in on the kind of oppression that you have experienced in the past or you are experiencing at the moment, or you believe it is right around the corner if you do not deal with the sin that is the natural inclination of your life. First oppression, my relationship with God has been affected. Is that where you are right now? Your relationship with God is not healthy? Number two, I'm destroying my relationship with others. Because of my sin, the way I treat others is damaging those most important relationships. Number three, it is or it will eventually affect my physical, mental, and emotional health. The thing I'm giving my life to will eventually or is right now affecting my physical, mental, or emotional health. And last of all, it is affecting or eventually will affect me financially. Lock in on one of those that best describes you. I know it would be a whole lot more fun if we could pick the one that best describes the person sitting next to me. <laughs> That's not the job today. So sin goes to oppression and ultimately leads to repentance. We desire God to deliver us when we finally hit rock bottom. But here's the deal. He promises that he will take us back. But... The process to deliverance is repentance. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful. He is just. He wants to forgive us, but we must confess. And some of you need to hear that. Some of you are saying, Tim, I have been here so many times before. I am a consistent failure, and there's no way God will take me back. Does judges let you know He'll take you back? Again, from, from, from chapter 1 to chapter 8, God has expressed his desire to spend time with us. He will take you back. I'm here to tell you, he's not tired of doing it. So I want to speak two options to you right now. I want you to lock in on which option best describes where you are at this exact moment. You've, you've, you've looked at what is your propensity, your inclination to sin. You have examined what oppression identifies where you are or where you're about to be. So with those two things in mind, where are you right now? Which one of these two options best describes you? Number one, I am not ready to come clean with God. And if you're not, be honest. Don't try to deceive yourself or others. I'm not ready to come clean with God. Number two, I am ready to come clean with God and repent. You've identified the one option in the area of your sin. You've identified the most common oppression that you have or likely will experience. You cannot get to the last step of the cycle, restoration, deliverance, except through the path of repentance. Patrick Morley in his book, I Surrender, he writes this. We cannot add Christ to our lives and not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. There is no rescue or deliverance without repentance. And here's why. Without repentance, we still have a God in the preeminent role rather than Jesus Christ. 
Nick Gumbel tells of a man who sent a check to the government for back taxes. By the way, April 15th, just over a month away. And he wrote this note. I felt so guilty for cheating on my taxes, I had to send you this check. If I don't feel any better, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> Many people want to come to God like that. God, I'll admit this part, but I'm not going to give full repentance. Unless I don't feel better. With this offering. Paul Summerall, that's a name most of you would recognize. He spent 50 years with the National Football League. He was drafted by the Detroit Lions in 52, played with the Chicago Cardinals and the New York Giants in the 61. After his retirement from the game, he joined CBS as a broadcaster, and in 1993, he switched over to Fox. During his CBS years, he and a fellow broadcaster party hard off the field. Summerall said, we raised Cain. I was the first guy at the bar and the last to leave. Summerall was told that if he kept on drinking, he was going to die. After checking himself into the Betty Ford Clinic, his counselor urged him to seek a better life through faith. At age 66, Pat Summerall gave his life to Christ and was baptized. In USA Today, he told the reporter that when the minister leaned me back in the water, I never felt so helpless in my life. And then he went on to say that I knew that now I was a Christian. I can't tell you how great life has been ever since. Baptism is a faith response to the gospel of Christ. In baptism, it is a picture of our helplessness. We are sinners in the hands of a merciful God. And everyone who recognizes their helplessness, their, their rock bottom place, God says, I will forgive. There's an old hymn that says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing. You cannot sin too often or too often for God not want to take you back. Are you ready to break the cycle? Can you live in peace in your life? Then why don't you repent right now? Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the story of the judges. Thank you for what it reveals to us in the present day 21st century about our own lives. Thank you that you have revealed to us the cycle that we have been caught in ourselves. We sin. We feel oppression. We cry out for help. We repent. And you come. You come. And you come. God, I pray that if we've discovered what this cycle is, we will also make the discovery of how to break that cycle. And that is to avoid the sin so easily plant us to live moment by moment, day by day, in dependence upon you, and then there will be peace in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you're listening to the whisper of any heart who says, I am ready to come clean before God today. There may be a man or a woman or a young person sitting here this morning who has never, ever come clean before you. They've never really dealt with this issue of sin in their life. They've never thought about the fact that when they die, there is an eternal destiny. It's either heaven or hell. But today they've heard enough to know that you are a God who loves them and wants to spend time with them. You want to spend eternity with them. And at this very moment, they're going to say, God, I don't know all there is to know about it, but I know enough that I want to trust you. I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you are my Savior. And I'm ready to experience your life. Father, for those others who are here today that have been Christians for years, that we have behaved somewhat like Israel, thank you that you continue to pursue us. And all you wait to do is hear us say, I was wrong. Come save me. And Father, you rescue us again. Father, we love you. We commit those choices to you that are being made at this very moment, knowing that you have heard every one of them. For those who've chosen not to make any decision about you today, that will not diminish your love or pursuit of them one eye on that. It simply delays your best for them. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, have a great day. See you next Sunday. Don't forget next Sunday night.